Welcome to Rheumatology Highlights Report. I'm Dr. Len Calabrese from the R.J. Fazenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to update you on the safety of biologics. My outline today, I'm going to talk about several drugs, including uh, the newest drug that has been approved for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, tofacitinib, and I'm going to talk about a few other complications particular zoster, TB, and some words about vaccination. So let's get going. This is a tall task. Tofacitinib, what is this drug? This is the first small molecule that is the inhibitor of the intracellular JAK kinase pathway. This is a central hub uh, that uh, is involved in the control of numerous inflammatory cytokines. So this functions uh, as a biologic, though it is an oral uh, small molecule pill. What can we say about this? Is it really a drug? Is it really a biologic? I will tell you my bias is that it looks like a biologic and walks like a biologic. Uh, and the first uh, study I show you by Kevin Winthrop looks about tofacitinib and TB. I will just kind of highlight these slides. You can go through them and download them um, uh, later. I want to make the point uh, that this is the most robust development program of any um, uh, advanced therapeutic we have in rheumatology. Nearly 5,000 patients were uh, treated in uh, global development programs all over the world. In this, even despite the fact that they were screened for TB, uh, there were 12 patients that developed active tuberculosis. Not unexpectedly, these came from high incidence areas around the world. At least 10 of them, four of them had extrapulmonary and disseminated disease, and 11 out of 12 had negative screening tests, which only tells us that screening is not perfect. The conclusion of this study is, is that within the context of this large global uh, development program, TB was rare in developed areas like the United States, but was seen in, in uh, areas of the world where there's a high incidence of TB. So that in the future, as this drug now moves into the clinic, patients who um, have a high background prevalence of latent TB or who travel and may newly acquire it are at risk. Uh, the next slide is about opportunistic infections, and these data come from the filing information from the, the FDA application. And I only point this out, there are 33 opportunistic in, infections reported at that time, including things such as pneumocystis, esophageal candidiasis, um, atypical TB, cryptococcus, et cetera. These are the same types of opportunistic infections uh, that we see in patients on other forms of biologic therapy. Um, the rates uh, were quite low, uh, but it is a minder for us to be uh, vigilant uh, about these types of complications. Now, the next slide, uh, which is a study presented by Gear uh, et al. at a recent uh, meeting in Washington, compared just kind of globally the events per 100 patient years between tofacitinib and, and other biologics, and that includes uh, uh, TNF inhibitors, uh, rituximab, abatacept, tocilizumab, and it just asked three large areas, the rates of malignancies, serious infectious episodes, and serious adverse events of all types. And as you can see, the biologics are represented by the 95% confidence intervals, and here's tofacitinib. Actually, in malignancy, uh, the, the global signal um, is actually lower. Uh, the serious infectious episode is well within um, uh, the all biologic range, and um, the serious adverse events is slightly lower. Now, this is, doesn't mean that this is safer by any means, but it means that it just within um, uh, the mind's eye, um, this is globally within the same range of these serious toxicities that we see uh, from the standard bearers. Now, let's talk about um, uh, zoster. Everyone understands zoster. Zoster is a dermatologic complication that is a, due to secondary reactivation of varicella, um, which in the adult population, um, and certainly people over the age of 50 or 60, uh, comes from their original chickenpox. Uh, for people born after the, the mid-1990s, 
uh, they have been immunized for varicella. Um, the, the disease itself uh, is uh, well recognized and it is a painful and morbid condition and has the potential for complications, including dissemination, post uh, herpetic neuralgia, um, and uh, even uh, vascular effects. So it's a serious disease. Um, in the fall of uh, 2012, the um, American College of Rheumatology hotline um, run by um, uh, uh, Jack Cush, Art Kavanaugh, and I believe Kevin Winthrop was the author of this, updated uh, us on herpes zoster uh, vaccination. Uh, this is indicated for patients on non-biologic DMARDs, but it is theoretically and practically contraindicated for patients on biologics. Unfortunately, patients on biologics are those that have the highest rate of zoster, so we're left in a lurch. So I'd like to uh, uh, review with you uh, a much discussed paper uh, by Zhang et al. and JAMA from uh, this past summer. This is the group led by Jeff Curtis, um, who is a noted outcomes researcher. He asked the question, well, there must be a lot of people out there who have inflammatory arthritis, who are on biologics, and who are inadvertently or uh, explicitly given uh, zoster vaccine. Um, it's going to curve through primary care physicians or going to the drugstore to get this. And so they queried a large Medicare database. They found over 400,000 patients with inflammatory arthritis. Um, uh, they looked within this database to see who were receiving um, uh, biologics versus non-biologic DMARDs. And they found that, interestingly, 4% of patients had received um, uh, zoster vaccine. The bottom line of this study was that in, even in patients on biologics, there appeared to be no adverse events, in particular early reactivation or dissemination of zoster within the first uh, six weeks, and that people who did get zoster appeared to have a lower rate the uh, zoster vaccine appeared to have a lower rate of zoster as they move forward. This is not an indication or a, an approval to give this vaccine to patients on biologics, but it's clear evidence that we need further and prospective studies to demonstrate its efficacy. Now, I bring come back to tofacitinib because this drug is kind of remarkable in one way. Uh, it uh, has a very good infection profile, malignancy profile, but something stands out. These are data um, looking uh, from the filing information um, before this drug was approved that was submitted to the FDA. You can see the rates for 100 patient years of herpes zoster um, uh, for all tofacitinib patients on the extreme left. And if you move this over, you can compare this to placebo and to a single comparator study with adalimumab. And what you can see is that the rates for zoster with tofacitinib appear higher than placebo and higher than the TNF um, comparator. This is present for both the low and the high dose group, and so it makes it somewhat distinctive. These are actually quite high rates of herpes zoster, so for people who are going to use this drug, um, we need to be vigilant about it and administer vaccines before these patients are placed on such drugs. One of the interesting things demonstrated in further filing information shown on uh, this slide is the effect of race, and this appears to be higher in Asians than non-Asians, and this remains unexplained. Finally, it should be remembered that herpes zoster is not only a serious infection because it's painful and morbid, but there are complications. Um, however, in the tofacitinib database, while there are a number of patients who had serious herpes zoster and a few had complications, by and large, these were kind of run-of-the-mill uh, herpes zoster infections. Um, finally, this last slide here, which looks at all uh, major adverse events, including serious infections, malignancy, lymphoma, lung cancer, myocardial infarction, perforation, and herpes zoster, comparing um, the tofacitinib to um, uh, data on TNF inhibitors and other biologics show that they are the same except the last column, and that is herpes zoster, where the rates are clearly higher. So we need to be thinking more about this moving forward. A few comments about some other drugs and other problems. Abitacept, 
Um, there was a nice study comparing the uh, long-term safety of uh, subcutaneous and IV abatacept, showing both are well tolerated, both in the short term and long term. There may be some hints that there is a pharmacokinetic um, uh, effect uh, that infections might be seen a little more early than late, just like TNF inhibitors, uh, but we need to keep our eye on this. Overall, good safety profile. A few words about TB. Um, biologics after active TB, is it possible? I mean, some patients develop uh, pulmonary tuberculosis or extra pulmonary tuberculosis. They need to be treated, but then their rheumatic disease comes back. Can we ever treat them again? This is a very nice study by Hernandez uh, showing that 50 cases of active TB that ultimately were treated for this TB, uh, 27 of patients uh, went back to TNF inhibitors. Um, uh, after treatment, and nine were actually restarted during treatment of TB. They all did quite well, so I think that this is uh, adding the, the pebble on the pile of safety, uh, that this is not a lifelong uh, contraindication. This study by Kure uh, said, how safe is treating latent TB? Because we have to use INH, it's a hepatotoxic drug. Patients are on biologics, which can have hepatotoxicity. Many of them are on uh, anti-metabolites. This uh, data in a large number of patients who were treated for latent tuberculosis show that despite our heightened concerns, the combination of traditional or biologic DMARDs and INH is clinically well tolerated uh, with only minor adverse events. Finally, in TB, there are two studies here to, uh, looking at repeat testing, one in a low incidence area in Colorado, one in a higher incidence area in TB. I'll focus on the Athens study. This is done by my um, dear friend and collaborator, Demetrius Vasilopoulos. And while this is a small study, it is a disturbing study. 50 patients in Athens who were about to start uh, biologics had baseline testing with skin test, chest x-ray, and both interferon gamma release assays, meaning T-spot and quantifuron. They were put on TNF inhibitors, and after a year, they were retested. Inexplicably, 15 or 30 percent of this group converted one of these assays. In other words, they went from negative to positive. What was disturbing about it was is that despite the fact that they all had repeat skin test, T-spot, and quantifuron, um, no patient had concomitant conversion of greater than one of these tests. In other words, it may have been a new skin test, a new T-spot, or a new quantifuron. Uh, none of these patients has diver de developed tuberculosis, so leaving us to wonder, is this just a reversal of energy? Is this a technical glitch of the test? Do these patients actually have newly exposed TB? Uh, much more data is needed from this study. We look forward to it in manuscript form. Finally, let's make a few comments about rituximab. Rituximab has been with us for a long time. There are people that have had many, many, many rounds of rituximab. So the question is, what happens when immunoglobulins become low? This is an ongoing study and monitoring of the long-term extension uh, reported by Ron Van Hollenhoven. Uh, these were people who were on long-term rituximab, which monitored every two to four months with their immunoglobulins. Then they, if they had a low isotype, M or G, then they compared the rates of infections before it was detected versus after. I've noticed the fact that patients were eliminated from this study if they had low immunoglobulins at baseline. So here are the data in graphic form. And basically, if I just point out uh, the IgG column, if you look at the extreme right, you see the rate of infection per 100 patient years in patients who never had low IgM, and if you look in the middle, you see patients who never had low IgG, uh, rates of 3.7 to 3.8 per 100 patient years. If you look at the patients who had low IgG at any um, uh, sustained period of time, the rates are 9 per 100 patient uh, years. And even when we looked beforehand, um, these people were vulnerable with rates of 8 per 100 uh, uh, patient years. What does this mean to me? Well, if you look at the package insert for rituximab, there's no 
uh, requirement to monitor immunoglobulins. I will tell you that in my view, best practices are screen for immunoglobulins at baseline, be hypervigilant of people who are um, uh, have low or borderline levels, and then I am repeating my immunoglobulins at the first infectious episode uh, while patients are on this therapy. I think that we'll see more about this in the future. Finally, what about vaccines? I'll give you two little snippets of data. One, tofacitinib by Kevin Winthrop. He asked the question, can you immunize on tofacitinib and do we need to stop the therapy? Uh, this is a, a, a patient who had a two-week break in oral tofacitinib. They immunized them uh, and looked at the vaccine rates uh, for both influenza and pneumococcal vaccine and basically um, found no difference in the rates of vaccine response between keeping the uh, tofacitinib going versus uh, a two-week holiday. Unfortunately, there's no comparator group, so we don't really know what these rates mean. They look kind of in the ballpark, much more to come. Finally, uh, a very, very nice study by uh, Bing Bingham from Hopkins looking at the influence of tocilizumab on vaccine rates. This looked at uh, both a T-cell dependent um, uh, tetanus toxoid and a T-cell independent pneumococcus uh, vaccine in a randomized controlled trial of methotrexate versus methotrexate plus tocilizumab. The bottom line for this study is uh, shown uh, uh, for the pneumococcus on this uh, histogram uh, showed that quite clearly methotrexate plus tocilizumab is associated with a palpable reduction in the frequency of serotype conversion uh, and thus, I think we add this to our biologics, such as rituximab, we really should probably strategize uh, to vaccinate before we start this drug. There was much less effect on tetanus toxoid. So his conclusion um, uh, is that um, uh, we need to be vigilant. So finally, um, I think I've given you a kind of a high altitude view of uh, some of the new drugs and some of the old problems. I'd like to welcome you to come back to RHR, and this is uh, my crew. Uh, there are many uh, other great presentations, and in 15 minutes, we will give you the world of rheumatology.